Hi, my name is Chris and I'm in a PhD program at Oklahoma State University studying behavior analysis and comparative psychology. Uh, I was always interested in, in animal behavior and when I was an undergraduate I studied, I was majoring in actually biology because I was interested in animals and then I started majoring in psychology because I was interested in behavior and uh, then I heard about comparative psychology and I got really excited about that because I, I, didn't, I didn't know about it before. And uh, really, I, it's, it's what I've always been interested in. And when I realized that it's actually um, an area that sort of overlaps with biology and psychology, and it's about the behavior of really all living things, uh, I, I knew that was really what I wanted to study. And there, there's a lot of different things that you can do with, with a degree like that. Um, but for me, the more time I spend in academia, you know, as an undergraduate, then getting a master's degree and in a PhD program, doing research and teaching, um, especially getting, getting to you know design your own experiments. For me, that really solidified the academic lifestyle for me. What I'd like to do is, is be a professor, and uh, that's not the only thing you can do with it. But but for me, that's that's what fits the most. To be able to to ask questions that excites you, and uh, really to, to some extent to, to some extent to do what you want. To be able to say I want to do this, I want to study this, and to have the skills and the ability to go do it. One thing I really like about uh, research in, in comparative psychology. So I have a lot of friends in, uh, in PhD programs doing behavioral research and uh, I think for pretty much all of them they, they study one type of animal and pretty much just one research question. And compared to psychology it's, it's the study of, of anything that, that does a behavior or thinks something. So it's, it's all animals in, including humans and I've worked with uh, just in the past couple of years uh, pigeons, uh, we have rattlesnakes that um, do some pretty cool things. Uh, I work a lot with bees, wasps, horses, um, turtles. I have a, we have bioluminescent algae, which are, which are pretty cool. It, it's a single cell organism, but it still does a thing, so it's still a behavior. And you know that's that's an area for a comparative psychology study. So I get to study all these different species, and and for me mostly I'm interested in animals, but um, but there's some human topics I'm interested in as well. Um, so that's really cool, and my friends don't get to do that, and most of them also study just one type of question. And there's even professors that spend, you know, like 25 years researching just one type of question. And I don't want to, I don't want to do that. I want to have a little more fun. And um, sometimes we study, you know, like really basic forms of learning uh, that are that are similar in, in multiple species. Sometimes we have questions really specific to one species, like for the rattlesnakes. Um, we wanted to know if, if they could learn to do things. Uh, to, to change the, the temperature in their environment. Because in the wild, they sort of have to, to go in different places to get, to get warm or cool. We want to see if they can do things like press a lever to change the temperature. And, and they can. It's, it's a basic form of learning, but then we can take that and expand that into their ecology uh, and other things they do. Um, but we do like uh, timing type research with, with all sorts of things from, from, the, from the bees to the horses to see how animals, uh, in some sense, perceive time. So, you know, I get to work with all different species and do all sorts of different questions. And that's really cool. It's always really exciting. So I mentioned, for me, the most fun part of studying comparative psychology is that you get to study so many different things. And that's also kind of hard, because a lot of times if you want to study something that other people don't study, um, good luck finding pre-made equipment for it. And what I spend a lot of my time doing is actually designing equipment, um, designing electronic devices, programming experiments, because we can't buy things to study like rattlesnakes or to study uh, learning in, in algae or to study uh, timing in bees and horses and it, it's a challenge to do that. That being said, uh, it's, it's a hard skill to start but once you sort of have a little help developing those skills in electronics and programming, um, you get to be where you can just do anything. And it's really cool to be the guy that everybody comes and says, hey, can you build this for me? You know, if I wanted to study this, how would I do it? And so now I have collaborations in, um, I mean, all over the United States, and I haven't even graduated yet. And it's because I'm, I'm a person that can do that for people. And people really want it. People are really excited about it. So it's a challenge, and you just have to, you just have to want it enough to learn how to, learn how to build things like that. Um, but once, once you're able to do it, you're indispensable. And that's, that's a really great thing to be an indispensable resource for other people. So if you're studying comparative psychology, you're probably coming from one of two areas, either a biology background or a psychology background. If, if you're coming from a biology background, you're missing out on a lot of really important psychology courses that you need to take. So in biology, you might take something like animal behavior or behavior ecology or evolution and behavior. 
but you're missing out um, especially on on things related to learning within an individual's lifetime you know not just instinctive behaviors you need to take things like you know psychology of learning um, the experimental methods in psychology are, are a little different because the topic's a little different. Take, take courses like that. If you can find a course in behavior analysis, that's really useful. If you can't find a course in behavior analysis, uh, you need to do some independent reading because that's just incredibly important. On the other hand, if you're coming from a psychology background, you should know a, a lot about behavior. You might still have to look for some of those classes, especially behavior analysis. Um, but you're missing out on a lot of the important biological foundations. So you should be looking for courses on the nervous system and the endocrine system. Uh, those, are, those are really important biological factors of behavior. Um, you should look at uh, courses like behavior ecology. A any type of ecology course is really useful. Um, or the animal behavior courses usually focus more on instinctive behaviors, but those are still really important. So, so my point is, either, either area you come from, you need to make sure you get a really, really broad background. And you can also take courses in like, uh, like veterinary science. Um, you can take anthropology and, and, uh, and cultural courses because, you know, if you're interested in humans. But you need to make sure you get a really broad background because from my perspective, psycholo uh, comparative psychology is, is an area that really um, combines, sort of joins the fields of biology and psychology. And that's a really important thing that needs to be done more. And what you want to be is you want to be the person that knows all about both of those areas so that you can be the person that joins those together. You don't want to be a person that says, oh, I'm a comparative psychologist, but I only really know about biology, or I only really know about psychology. You want to know about all of it. You want to make yourself um, that important person. Because then, if you're working with a group of people, you're the one that can connect people from different fields, and they're both really big fields that need to work together. So, so getting a broad background is really important. Also, um, sort of for general skills for sciences that are really important for psychology, one is statistics. You need to be really comfortable with statistical analyses. Um, a lot of people, in, including professors doing research, know, know how to run the stats test. And they know, well, you know, this is what I was told to do when I run and I get a p-value and blah, 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 it's fine. But they're not always really fluent with them. You need to be really comfortable with them. You need to really understand the minutia of why one statistical test is used versus another one. Because actually, it's really important and sometimes using the wrong test is the difference between getting a not significant result and a significant result. You need to be really critical of your statistical tests, understand them really well. Um, two, computer programming is, is a really useful skill for sciences and also in other aspects of life. Um, it's just a really nice tool to have. And uh, some, some people are a little intimidated, intimidated by it at first, but if, if you get, you know, take like an intro computer programming course, see how you like it, and then usually just, you know, one or two courses, you should feel pretty comfortable with it. And you can teach yourself a lot from there. And it's a really useful skill because, um, Everybody in the sciences needs needs a computer programmer, and you want to be the person they go to that says, "Hey, help me program this." Another one is if if you can get good at building things, um, electronics, microcontrollers. I use a parallax repeller uh, myself. Microcontrollers are just really really useful for automating experiments. You know, automating your data collection, um, all sorts of things. And again, if if you can be the guy that people go to to say, "Hey," This is what I want to do, and I kind of understand what I want, but I don't really know how to build things, but you know how to build things. So help me out here. We'll collaborate. That collaboration is really useful. Um, you know, because I do that, you know, I work with people all over the country. And so you don't have to be an expert in all three of those areas, but if you can be really good with one or two, then you're going to make yourself um, uh, really a really desirable laboratory member. People in your laboratory are really going to want to work with you on all these different projects. You'll, you'll pretty easily find collaborations with other people because they always need somebody that's really good with statistics. They always need somebody that's really good with programming. And if you're doing comparative psychology research where you're studying different species or unusual topics, you might need somebody that can build something new for you. So those are really, really important skills to have, really for any science, but especially for comparative psychology.